Um, it, it is a great pleasure to introduce a chap to you all. His, his name is Simon O'Brien. Uh, he was a captain in the Australian Army and subsequently has moved on from the Army and is now my boss. But keeping that aside, uh, we thought, <laughs> OK, Simon, you can come on the radio. No, that's not true. Um, we wanted to talk to someone who um, Anzac Day is obviously really important to him and get his sense on it as a younger soldier rather than we hear a lot of the you know, 80-year-old, 90-year-old, all those sort of stories. But hearing from a bloke in his late 30s who was part of the military, good morning, Simon. Good morning, fellas. Uh, thanks for having me on. Always good to have you on uh, the program. Every time we've had you on, we've enjoyed it. <laughs> so uh, far. Simon, Rob Cameron here. Just wanted to uh, start off by talking about the important difference in the uh, the time that you serve compared to, I suppose, the reason for Anzac starting, which was the, the horrors of Gallipoli. And, and one thing that I... I think is really different is that there were 15 and 16 year old boys who who were desperate to get to go on an an adventure that war was, uh, and their attitude to starting it off was a lot different to a a, a modern um, teenager looking at the potential of joining the Australian Army. And I suppose for that reason, the mindset of what happens in there and what sort of person comes out of it is vastly different to what it was um, 110 years ago. Yeah, exactly right, uh, Rob. So a lot of people joined for different different reasons over over the journey. I joined when I was nineteen in two thousand and four, uh, and was in the army for ten years. But um, you're exactly right. Where particularly during the First World War, um, you know, fifteen, sixteen year old men uh, or boys um, joined uh, because they identified with something um, and you know wanted to you know uh, you know serve with their friends with their mates um for something that they thought was bigger than them um you know come forward a few more years to the second world war and, and vietnam and it was more of a conscription focus so it was your name was pulled out of a ballot um so i, I suppose you might go into things with a different mindset conscription hasn't been around since vietnam in australia uh but it's certainly a volunteer force uh at the moment and it was a volunteer force that i joined um so uh, and people joined for different reasons, um, but I joined as a 19-year-old wanting to do something different and to, you know, experience the world uh, and make some great mates along the way. So, uh, and certainly for me, that was, uh, you know, that rung true throughout the 10 years that I was in the Army. I suppose a lot of youngsters are looking at uh, career opportunities rather than joining, thinking, I'm going to war and shoot at people. That doesn't seem to be the, the, the initial mindset. Sure. Well, Iraq was around when I joined in 2004, but I certainly didn't join the army thinking that I was going to go to Iraq um, uh, or Afghanistan, for that matter. I I joined because I was a 19-year-old who didn't quite know what he wanted to do uh, as an adult. I was at university at the time, and uh, d to be frank with you, Rob, um, studying accounting wasn't overly stimulating. I <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Never now, has been. The, the, the penny's just dropped now while I'm doing all these accounting for him. <laughs> <laughs> Morning, Jonathan. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, I wanted something different to do. So, um, and certainly as 19, 20, 21, those kind of ages, yeah, it's fun. You, you do lots of cool stuff um, and you meet some great people along the way. Um, so, but different people join for different reasons and, and that probably has changed through time but but ultimately a lot of people get out of the similar things and that's mateship um and some and so uh, some heck of an experience is good and bad yeah the the reasonings uh, for going in and and then the person that you were coming out did you did you achieve what you intended to do were you surprised with the person that was that came out uh, I think so, but I was at a completely different stage stage of my life. I left when I was 29. I'm 38 now. Um, for those who wanted to do the maths, um, but and what I, you know, the person I was at 28 is very different to the person I was at 19. Um, and uh, you know, what I wanted to achieve when I joined was to, as I said before, do something different when I left university. Um, but when I was 28, I'd achieved a lot of things in my army career. And I had different priorities because I was a different, at a different stage in life. Um, you know, I say to many people, the pinnacle of my service was, was leading soldiers on operations in Afghanistan. And when I came home from Afghanistan, I thought, well, I've, well, I've done, 
I've, I've ticked the big box um, that I wanted to that I wanted to achieve. So what's my next goal? Uh, and Neil knows me a little bit and knows that I'm not one to just stand still. Uh, once I've achieved something, I'm looking for what I can do next. So I, I felt, you know, after just shy of 10 years, um, but I'll round up to 10, uh, I'd, uh, I'd done what I wanted to do and I was looking for that next challenge. I think one of the things I've noticed as an ex-school teacher, and again, I'm drawing comparisons in any way, but a lot of school teachers' pa- parents are school teachers, and their parents were school teachers, and it's kind of the thing you do. Uh, I know that your dad was in the military, and therefore you were brought up in a, an environment where moving from house to house and all that sort of stuff was pretty normal. How much of that influence was part of saying, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll join the army? Well, you're absolutely right. Yeah, my, my dad was, was a soldier for 35 years, um, and all I knew as a kid was, uh, was following him around the country and around the world. Um, you know, as I was growing up, we were very fortunate to live in lots of different places, including uh, a stint in the UK, which, um, which was great. Um, you know, but it comes with positives and negatives. You get to see a lot of things. But, you know, I, I changed schools every, every two years up until the age of 15. Um, so you make friends and then you... Uh, and then it's time to go and, and pack up somewhere else. But in saying that, you know, joining the army wasn't a complete foreign concept to me um, because I had some level of familiarity uh, with the system, you know, just by nature of my upbringing. You know, when I, uh, I often, uh, you know, look back with uh, great joy, at, you know, when I was in primary school, you know, my dad would bring, you know, armoured personnel carriers to our Christmas party. You know, not many... <laughs> <laughs> Not many kids. My dad would bring a bag of chips. Yeah, <laughs> or a helicopter to my scout camp uh, and things like that. You know, uh, I don't think the Army does those things anymore, which is, which is unfortunate. But So, yeah, when I joined the Army, it wasn't, it, you know, it was something which was a realistic option um, for me, whereas other kids who haven't grown up, you know, being aware of that environment, it might not, might not make as much sense. Um, so I was very happy to do it, but also, you know, at the age of, uh, 29 when I was uh, approaching 30, uh, you know, wanting to start a family, settle down. I didn't necessarily want the same thing for my kids. Um, so I had the awareness of what that meant on me and my upbringing. Uh, and I've got two beautiful young kids now and I like the stability that they've got in their life, you know, not moving them schools every two years, not forcing them to change, uh, you know, change friendship groups, etc. So I suppose I've, I've gone into being a dad um, with my eyes open a bit more. Not saying that I had a terrible childhood, not at all, because I had a wonderful childhood. And uh, But uh, I think I, I want different things for my kids. That's all. We should also acknowledge Fiona, who's a, a lovely lady to whom Simon is married. And I guess you know, she's a professional as well and gives her an opportunity to, to build a career when you stabilise yourself a little bit. Doing what she does would make it pretty hard for her to settle into a, a career as well. Uh, that is absolutely uh, right, Neil. So uh, I just dug you out of a hole. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> My mum wasn't able to work uh, much. Well, she was able to work, but she wasn't able to build her own career and her own identity. Yeah. Um, so it meant that she was doing a lot of temporary work, a lot of casual work as we were moving around uh, whilst I was a kid. And it wasn't really until we settled in Melbourne uh, that she was able to build something for herself from a professional standpoint. Um, so, uh, yeah, my wife's a nurse, um, and uh, but by the time we met, she was a flight attendant. So uh, the nomadic kind of uh, streak in both of us uh, was aligned, uh, but certainly once the kids came along, it allowed us to, to put down our roots somewhere and, and establish something for ourselves, both personally, personally and professionally. We're talking to a former Australian Army Captain Simon O'Brien. Simon, the, the the time that you had with your father, you'd have some preconceived ideas about how the military operated, very much discipline, uh, follow without question your leader. Um, the the recent discussion around events in Afghanistan that you lived and breathed haven't necessarily come out uh, favourably for this reason, that you do blindly almost follow leadership. Um has, has that had an effect on your life, uh, negatively or positively, the, the, the Brereton Report findings on on activity in the Australian military? Uh, look, it's obviously disappointing, um, and I'll, I'll be the first to say I wasn't, I wasn't there necessarily when the incidents um, that the Brereton Report are referring to, uh, so it's difficult for me to judge. But what, what I would also say is I, I can understand uh, the complexity 
uh, of war and the way that it makes people think. Um, and certainly, uh, you know, approaching these kind of conversations with a degree of context is, um, you know, is really important. So, uh, you know, we as a nation have sent people, using Afghanistan as an example, um, I only went to Afghanistan once uh, for nine and a half months, but there's many, many people in our uh, in our services who went to Afghanistan multiple times, and I'm talking up to 10. Uh, and it has an effect on you. You know, it changes the way that you think, uh, you know, constantly living in fear that today is your last day uh, or that, you know, turning around the corner, um, you know, there's a bullet with your name on it necessarily. Um, you know, it, it changes the way that your mind works and it changes your decision making. Uh, and particularly, you know, when you are faced with that day after day after day, um, it, it takes a toll um, on people. So I can understand where people's decision making can become, you know, a bit warped potentially. And I'm not, I'm not assuming, uh, you know, the particulars of, uh, you know, some of the events that have been reported back here. Because I'm, I'm the first to say that I wasn't there. Uh, and very much, you know, even if you were there, there's a big difference between, you know, being the one, uh, you know, in the moment and, and being, you know, 30 metres away on the other side of a, of a tree line or a hill. Uh, because, you know, I've got many experiences in my service uh, in Afghanistan where we had some terrible things occur. Uh, and, uh, it, you know, the experience that one person has uh, and the experience that another person has has at the same event can be can be two very different things and that goes back all the way to the original comment which was just about a simple thing that probably come into my head when you were talking then was in 1912 or 13 youngsters went off with with probably an attitude of they had nothing to lose but while you're over there you've got you've got family you've got um probably a lovely home you're talking about your 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 privileged childhood you have got something to lose so clearly there's a different mindset as when you go into that battle Absolutely, yeah, I, and it probably it was something that was out of my mind for most of my time in Afghanistan. But I, I say to my wife often, um, you know, there was there was an event two weeks before coming home that really said to me, "Well, actually, there's a lot. I've got a lot to lose here," mm. um, and it really kind of changed my perspective on things and it made me appreciate what I do have, um, and that uh, you know made me much more appreciative when I landed back in uh, back in Australia. Uh, because, uh, you know, life is worth living. A really public kind of uh, arena that we see a lot of, and sadly, um, Rob, he barracks in Melbourne. Uh, we talk about AFL footballers. Go, Dees! <laughs> Go, number 27. <laughs> um, 31's Bailey Fritch, by the way. Um, y- you, you hear of AFL footballers stopping and then coming back into what we call normal life. And got no idea. The structures disappeared. They're not earning the money they were earning. I'm, I'm guessing that when you step out of the military, where you've been told what to do, when to do it, what to wear, you know, how how is that adjustment to we'll call normal life? Uh, I, it's funny, Neil. I was actually having this actual conversation with uh, with a former uh, Western Bulldogs captain, premiership captain, in fact, Easton Wood, on Anzac Day uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, who retired uh, just after Melbourne won the grand final in 2021. Did they win a grand final, did they? <laughs> You've never mentioned it. Didn't bring that up, <laughs> didn't bring that up to us. But, <laughs> uh, but we were talking about that exact thing, that um, you, know, you become so indoctrinated into a particular way of life um, for so many of your formative years uh, as a person, um, you know, from your late teens through to you know, your late 20s, early 30s or thereabouts, and he was exactly the same. You know, he's, uh, he said to me, you know what, Simon, I've never had to plan ahead, not once in my life. You know, I've had people around me that have told me what I need to do tomorrow, what I need to do the day after. And that's certainly the way uh, in the military as well. You know, everything is, is planned out in a way, for good or for better or for worse, but everything is, is provided for you. You don't have to think about things like getting health insurance or, you know, what do you do when you need to go see the doctor? Uh, when you get sick or, you know, how do I find somewhere to live? Um, you know, all of these things that people learn, you know, just as, you know, part of growing up and being an adult, um, the, the military puts around you uh, to, you know, uh, look after you when, um, when you're in the service. But you're right, when you, when you leave, all of a sudden you've got to learn how to be a, be an adult. 
uh, at the age of 30 or thereabouts. So it's, uh, it's, certainly, it's certainly different. A lot of people um, find it quite confronting um, and take a little while to get used to. And many, and many people actually go back because they liked the warm blanket that was around them uh, whilst they're in the whilst they're in the defence force. So, but uh, but fortunately, I, I was able to find my way. Simon, let's talk about Anzac Day. You may or may have uh, not lost uh, an ally in, in Afghanistan. Your your father may or may not have in his time. But if you have, and and the way the day sits with you compared to someone like myself who has had no active involvement at all, what's it like for you now? Yeah, I I think for, for me, it's it's. Uh, there's two things. It's probably it's a significant day of reflection for me. Um, I, I was in a situation where I I lost mates uh, whilst serving overseas. Um, two of them uh, in particular. Uh, and uh, for me, it's it's a time to reflect. Um, and uh, you know, not only on my service but on theirs uh, and their family and the and the people around them. And it's also that people who since returning home have had had struggles as well because we often forget that you know just because you made it home doesn't mean you're okay um so there's a big kind of mental health uh piece as well uh that you know means that it's a it's an annual re- reminder in my calendar to reach out to people and make sure that they're okay because there's many people who are doing it tough um since they've come home but also it's it's a day for me to um you know, connect with my mates, and uh, we tell we tell kind of stories and and give each other a fair amount of stick about the good times and the bad. Um, but it's it's a great bonding time as well. So so that that's what it is for me. Um, for other people, it's it's different, um, and and I think that that's okay. That it can be different things to different people. Uh, Simon, when I was a youngster, Anzac Day was something that we observed, but the the diggers and and, and other members of the military, male and female, seem to, to commemorate on their own. The modern Anzac Day seems to be more of a whole community commemorating together. Is is that been a positive change for you? Absolutely. Um, absolutely. Uh, you know, I try to involve my kids um, as much as possible and my family and friends. Uh, it, it shouldn't be an us and them uh, thing. And, and as I said before, uh, you know, it means different things to different people and that's fine. Uh, and I think we should celebrate that rather than thinking, you know, oh, you weren't there or, uh, you know, you don't understand. Um, that's never good for anyone going insular like that. Uh, the more that we can wrap our arms around each other and uh, in share in what it means for different people, I think that's only a good thing. I was reflecting with Rob the other day. Um, when I was a kid at primary school, um, we used to be sent along the day before in our scout uniform or our cub uniform. I wasn't quite sure why we did that. Uh, and, and it was almost funereal. There's a word for you, Rob. You happy with that? I'm going to look that up. Uh, it, it was, it, like, we were thinking, you know, all the old soldiers that had died and they'd given their lives for us. And like, there was nothing, and there's not a lot to celebrate, but acknowledgement of the positive activity and the, 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 the community spirit that, our Anzacs have provided us and it was really about it was like going to your granddad's funeral and I think that has changed as well yeah I, I would certainly echo that Neil um, and I and I know it's uh, uh, I've been to some of those Anzac Day services particularly when I was younger where it was a very somber um, affair and you know the talk was all about uh, you know Gallipoli and you know World War One and World War Two, and I just didn't identify with any of that mm. to be frank like my grandfather served in World War Two, and he was lucky enough to make it home. But it, I suppose that talk about you know things that happened over a hundred years ago, I just didn't identify with. Uh, and I think you know as time goes on, people are going to identify less and less with that. So it's more about what are the stories of today, and not necessarily the bad ones. You know, there's some brilliant stories mm. um, that we should be celebrating about uh, about service, but also uh, about mateship and uh, you know experiences and whatnot that, that can draw out the positives of community uh, as opposed to, you know, re, you know, trying to draw our minds back to something which was, you know, 100 years ago. The perception of how you are viewed, Simon, uh, as a youngster, I, my, my relatives talked about the, the, the servicemen returning from World War II as heroes. We, we then saw the Vietnam veterans treated as social pariahs. When you've, you come out of the 
services uh, as a 29 year old how did you feel when you walked through the community and and announced that you were an ex-serviceman uh well i i returned from afghanistan to a place called townsville uh which is a garrison town uh to be to be frank uh so obviously warmly received back home uh in townsville i suppose but then uh, moving back to Melbourne uh, and then leaving the army uh, uh, into Melbourne, I, I suppose being being a soldier isn't easily identifiable uh, in Melbourne. We're just uh, you know there's a lot more things going on, and we don't have you know a big military presence in the southern states other than uh, Puckapunyal and a few other places. Um, so it it almost became more of an entity, um to introduce you to someone as a as a former soldier. Uh, so I certainly didn't. Um, kind of have any of those negative uh, receptions that that our unfortunately our Vietnam vets um, faced into when they returned. Um, people were curious uh, with me as opposed to uh, and asked questions with good intent. Um, uh, but I can understand certainly that other people might have had different experiences. Um, but for me, it was certainly a positive one. Well, speaking of positive ones, um, I think we we should all agree that uh, this has been a really really good chat because I think. Part of my issue with Anzac Day, and you and I have chatted about this at work, that I don't have any family involvement. I have no aunties and uncles uh, anyway. My father was in that gap between the, the wars. My grandfather was in the gap between the wars. My, my brother wasn't old enough to go to Vietnam. So there's that kind of, I'm in that kind of really weird, no family personal connections at all. But I think just the fact that we're hearing a different story to the, the you know, I remember back in 1914, yeah, it's about that community thing. It's about celebrating the great work of, of our servicemen and women. So um, thanks for taking some time out of your otherwise busy Saturday morning. I suspect there's an ice cream shop in Hawthorne that's screaming out, where are the O'Briens this morning? Um, <laughs> I would think that you get them down there and buy them one. <laughs> well, maybe not ice cream. That was last night, but oh, okay. it be a bike ride in my future, absolutely. Excellent. Um, Simon, thanks. For, I know it's a, a, yeah, a, a really personal thing to talk about and certainly appreciate you uh, taking some time out on Saturday morning to chat to the viewers. The viewers? The listeners. I'm in a bad way. <laughs> Simon, thank you so much. Nice to meet you uh, verbally and, and thank you for your open and openness and honesty this morning because it's a tricky subject to get right but uh, as Neil pointed out a different view is always a good view Thanks for having me on fellas all the best. No worries, see you during the week There he is, Simon O'Brien, former captain in the Australian Army and a very impressive young man yeah, that was that was good. Different uh, view of things, and and we do know that will change from era to era. But there is no doubt it it is a it is a pleasant thing for a me at my vintage to have had a view of Anzac Day, and then I go to a service and you see young people there with marching with family members and wearing medals of probably deceased um, uh, relatives. I, I think that is uh, is wholesome and and good. And we don't need to celebrate, we need to uh, commemorate, and I think we do it very well these days. And I tell you what, uh, those who have worked with me over the journey will know that I'm the sort of person that uh, just goes in and gets stuff done. I, I No planning, just get it done. You've heard the expression, planned with military precision. Yeah, is he good? <laughs> oh, he's, uh, he can tell you what we'll be doing at 3 o'clock on Thursday the 17th of August. He and I would probably not get along that well. Uh, he's a ripping bloke.